Uh, so I'm delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Harold Sonny White, who is the uh, Director of Advanced Research and Development at uh, Limitless Space Institute. Sonny, welcome. Um, and before we get into your new job at LSI, tell me a little bit about your career, if you will. Sure, Nick. Uh, and by the way, thanks for having me today. I, it's really nice to get a chance to, uh, to chat with you. Uh, obviously, it'd be even better if it were in person. Uh, be good to be able to hang out with you again. But um, uh, background for me in terms of the interest in aerospace, uh, you know, I, I've been interested in aerospace since a very young age. I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area, spent a lot of time at the National Air and Space Smithsonian, getting a chance to see all those great achievements and so forth, just I think really fueled the fire. Uh, so I've kind of known from a very early age that I was very interested in aerospace, and I kind of always had a, a sense that the power and propulsion was the, the area that I was most interested in. And that kind of drove me in the pursuit of, of technical studies. And when I was in university, I got a, a you know, bachelor's in engineering, mechanical engineering. Uh, I, um, I picked up a job working at uh, Boeing uh, up in Wichita, Kansas in 96, right out of university. Uh, worked there for about four years, got my master's degree while I was here. I, I kind of recognized that I needed advanced degrees to be able to work in the area where I wanted to go, which was power and propulsion. Um, got my master's while I was there. Uh, in 2000, uh, I was uh, very fortunate and blessed to pick up a job uh, working with Lockheed Martin in Houston. So that kind of brought me from uh, Wichita, Kansas, down to Houston into the space program. So that was kind of the, the first entry into human space flight for me. Worked at Lockheed for, for four years uh, and then transferred to NASA in 2004 uh, and worked at NASA for 16 years uh, until just recently last December. Um, uh, I retired and uh, joined Limitless Space Institute, uh, giving me an opportunity to focus very heavily on, on pursuing advanced power and propulsion. So uh, that's kind of uh, the, the one and a half minute uh, uh, bio. So, oh, but yeah, I, I, I picked up my PhD in physics while I was at NASA. Uh, and so that was kind of the, the final uh, set of credentials that I needed that helped me have all the mathematical skills and capabilities to kind of navigate in this world. So in my book, Sonny, you have one of the coolest jobs on the planet, which oh. is you uh, conceptually map how it is we are going to get from here out to the planets and even beyond that to the stars. Tell me a little bit about that roadmap and how you derived it. Right. You know, the <clears throat> space exploration, human space exploration especially, we've been in low Earth orbit for a very long time. Uh, we we uh, obviously were very uh, fortunate and successful in the uh, in the 60s and early 70s and and uh, putting uh, human beings on the surface of the moon, um, but the distances associated with accomplishing those missions are, are in the grand scheme of things very very small. Um, I think uh, Douglas Adams has a, a very uh, appropriate quote: um, "Space is big, uh, mind-bogglingly big," and I think that that's uh, uh, you know, a, a perfect articulation of part of the issue when you start thinking about human exploration uh, beyond uh, the Earth-Moon system out to Mars, and then even more importantly to the outer solar system beyond the asteroid belt to Jupiter, the gas giants, uh, uh, maybe one day out to the to the deep outer solar system. Right, Voyager One's out at about uh, 120 some odd astronomical units. Uh, that's the distance from the Earth to the Sun, if you kind of think of that as a measuring stick. 120-ish of those, and then you'll see the little Voyager spacecraft. So space is just mind-bogglingly big. Um, and the amount of uh, energy that's necessary to move uh, people around in the solar system uh, in time frames that are compatible with, with us, right? So if you imagine uh, you were willing to you know, take 200 days to get to any destination in the solar system. Uh, the amount of kinetic energy you have to put into your vehicle and take out of your out of your vehicle to get from here to say Saturn in 200 days, it's it's over an order of magnitude larger uh, energy than what we do just to get to low Earth orbit. So it's uh, the, the the physics of that doesn't change. There's there's nothing that's going to change that. That's the requirement. Uh, and so in order to achieve those types of realizations of having human exploration in the outer solar system, maybe even one day onto the stars, you have to have significant improvements uh, in power and propulsion. Um, so 
um, in, in, in two minutes or less, well, maybe three minutes or less, I'll, I'll articulate a, a couple of uh, swim lanes where, whereby we might try and explore ways to, to tackle that kind of a problem of being able to take humans anywhere in the solar system in 200 days and maybe even uh, interstellar one day. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of cover the, the waterfront in the context of known physics, uh, known engineering to unknown physics, uh, uh, unknown engineering. Uh, so in the in the first category, known physics, known engineering, um, you know there is a power and propulsion approach that uh, we could use uh, that would enable, in effect, human exploration of the entire solar system, if you will, to maybe help us realize some kind of a, a solar system wide uh, uh, culture, economy, community, what have you, and we could we could kind of bring the resources of the solar system uh, to uh, to bear on the problems of of humanity, if you will. And that is nuclear electric propulsion, a flying equivalent to some of the things you might think of when you think of terrestrial power uh, connected to uh, some kind of propulsion system that ionizes a gas and then accelerates it using some kind of a, uh, electrostatic or electromagnetic uh, approach to be able to have uh, very high fuel efficiency, if you will. So the, the fuel tanks don't have to be massive to be able to uh, accomplish these tasks. And so uh, but we know how to build uh, uh, nuclear reactors, and uh, we've actually built one that flew in space, SNAP-10A. Uh, the Russians have flown a number of reactors in space. Now, these are all small compared to the things I might be thinking of. Uh, when I think of human exploration uh, of the outer solar system with, with nuclear, you know, I'm in the, the one megawatt uh, uh, to maybe up to 100 megawatts one day in the, in the far future. And one megawatt is like the, the amount of power that you would get out of a locomotive, maybe a small locomotive. We'll just kind of put that in context. Um, so, in the context, in, in in the uh, in the swim lane of fission, known engineering, known physics, nuclear electric propulsion is a way for us to uh, allow humanity to go to destinations in the outer solar system. Uh, and so, fusion would allow us to uh, be able to have quicker transits to the outer solar system. Uh, and fusion would also potentially allow us to carry, carry heavier payloads. And, and, and then in the, the, you know, the big question about interstellar, fusion uh, would potentially uh, allow us to do slow transits to interstellar destinations. The, you know, the, the Daedalus uh, uh, study sponsored by the you know, British Interplanetary Society, um, uh, you know, that, that spacecraft, that paper spacecraft that they studied was based on a fusion propulsion scheme. And so the, the target for that was uh, Bernard Star, which is about six light years away uh, with an anticipated transit time of 50 years. To break through propulsion, what, what uh, gives you hope that we may achieve some form of breakthrough, Sonny, in, you know, in my lifetime that would allow us a concept, a, 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 a propulsion concept to get us out of the solar system and to the stars? Uh, you know, that's a, uh, I'm going to answer your question a little differently than how you asked it. Um, I, I think in the process of exploring the frontiers of physics, right, you know, that just that, that process itself is interesting to me uh, as, a, as a scientist. And so I, I'm, I'm keenly interested in, in a few specific ideas probably would be uh, most closely categorized with the, the pilot wave uh, approach to the microscopic world, if you will. Uh, but we're specifically working on something we call the dynamic vacuum model. Uh, and so um, the, to date, we've been able to go through and show uh, that uh, uh, electron orbitals of the hydrogen atom can be viewed as acoustic resonances of this dynamic vacuum medium that we, we maintain uh, exists uh, everywhere. Um, now, the fact that we can show that electron orbitals are acoustic resonances of this dynamic medium says uh, that the internal constituents that make up this dynamic medium are capable of exchanging momentum and energy because they can manifest longitudinal waves, right? And so if the internal constituents are capable of uh, exchanging energy and momentum to be able to manifest these longitudinal waves, and that means an external agent can also exchange energy and momentum with them. Thereby, you could potentially push off of them. Uh, and so this is kind of the, the, a, a technical way of, of uh, articulating what, 
what would be the mechanism behind how Arthur C. Clarke's uh, quantum vacuum ramjet might work. Uh, and so that's why something like that's very interesting to me. Uh, and we've had a lot of success, uh, you know, with any idea, you, you, gotta, you gotta figure out, does it predict anything that, that violates what we've seen to date? Uh, uh, and if it doesn't, does it predict the same things that we see? Uh, we've had a lot of success with this model, uh, this dynamic vacuum model, to go through and explain uh, atomic orbitals, atomic structure, uh, and we've expanded it into molecular chemistry. And so that's certainly very interesting. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, I've already given you that, that potential background thought thread I have on how it might connect to uh, uh, propulsion one day. Um, in addition to that, um, the Casimir uh, force phenomena, this is, uh, uh, some people may be familiar with it, uh, but it's a uh, it's this prediction of quantum mechanics that, uh, uh, you know, at the microscopic level, uh, the vacuum isn't empty. It's this, you know, this, uh, this seething maelstrom of, of fluctuations. Uh, and that's kind of a, a, a precursor to what we've, we've developed with our dynamic vacuum model. But the Casimir phenomena is a way to realize negative vacuum energy density. And so from uh, uh, the perspective of the field equations for the idea of a space warp or a wormhole, that's the necessary ingredient to kind of make that trick potentially work. Uh, and so in the process of exploring the dynamic vacuum model, does that potentially provide us some mechanisms to uh, try and increase the magnitude that, of negative vacuum energy that we can produce um, to maybe potentially move the idea of a, of a space warp from uh, the premise of uh, uh, feasible uh, a plausible, excuse me, from plausible to feasible, right? You know, there's, you, you can say something's mathematically plausible, but that doesn't mean that you can make it, if you will. Uh, and so can we, in the process of exploring the frontiers of physics, can we find ways to move that idea from uh, plausible into the feasible category? I, I don't know. I, I can't make any prediction for either one of those two, but uh, uh, to date, the results are encouraging, and, I, I, you know, we're going to continue to pursue it. Uh, actually, regardless of the outcome, that's just science sometimes. You, just, you pursue things because it's interesting and you want to figure out how far you can push your ideas before they break or they continue to have success. Uh, just for the layman, the lay person, can you sort of explain what a spacecraft, how it would, how it would operate in this regime that you've just described? What would it, what would it look like? How, how would it warp space in order to get from, crudely speaking, A to B? Right, right. Um, you know, we, uh, <clears throat> I did an education outreach uh, a number of years ago. Um, uh, so let me back up even further. Uh, in, in 2011, um, uh, NASA and DARPA got together and, and uh, hosted this uh, uh, a meeting in, in Florida called the 100 Year Starship Symposium. And they asked me to come in uh, and give a talk. And as part of supporting my talk, I did some numerical analysis of the, uh, uh, the, the, the mathematics associated with the idea of a space warp. I kind of did a sensitivity study. So this was a, an interesting combination of physics and engineering, right? Sensitivity studies are sometimes something you might think of from an engineering perspective. But I did a sensitivity study on the, the field equations and um, discovered that uh, uh, in terms of what the field equations predict, if you change one of the characteristics, like um, uh, I'm going to use some hand puppets to kind of illustrate uh, how the phenomena would work. Uh, so the, the, the mathematics requires, if you've got some, imagine, you know, there's, there's this, uh, here, I'm going to use hand puppets. Yes. American football. So this is uh, there we go. We won't show the <laughs> won't show the logo. You can tell them how they are. So if this is where the crew is, kind of the crew module, there's some kind of a, a toroidal ring of negative vacuum energy density that's needed for the field equation. So this this ship proper would be connected through pylons or something with with some kind of a ring that goes around it uh, that enables it to to move really quickly to go from point A to, to point B. Um, and so in the process of doing the, the numerical analysis for 100 year Starship Symposium, I figured out that if you change that, the thickness of that ring to make it thicker, uh, you reduce the, in effect, kind of the strain, if you will, uh, that you have to put on space time to make the trick work. 
Uh, and so that, that reduced the amount of, uh, of negative vacuum energy density uh, to make the premise work. Uh, now, after I presented some of that stuff at uh, 100 Year Starship Symposium, I found some artwork from the, the TV show Star Trek uh, done by Matthew Jeffries in the 60s. Uh, and there were some early concepts for the, the vehicle that we all kind of know and are familiar with in the TV show. Uh, and one of the versions had uh, something that was, you had some central ship connected to some rings that run, went around it. Uh, and so the thing that I found fascinating about that is that uh, uh, here's a guy that came up with a, a concept for an interstellar vehicle, that this warp kind of vehicle, uh, and the, the, the mathematics hadn't been published yet. And so just in the process of exploring the artistic side, he came up with this premise and it, so it was really cool, but there were a few major issues with that. And so uh, I worked with um, uh, Mike Akuda and Mark Rademacher to update that artwork based on what the, the, the physics requires and what my sensitivity analysis uh, showed would, would make it uh, plausible. Um, and we came up with a concept known as the IXS Enterprise. And so uh, anyone that's curious can go look up an image of that. Uh, and that gives you an idea of what something this, you know, the, the math and physics, what it, would, what it would look like if you were to translate it into something that had people on board as opposed to maybe like a, a TV show. So um, that, that would be pretty helpful. Maybe you could throw a, a picture of that in a video or something like that. Too, so. For sure, we can do that. Uh, absolutely. Well, um, it, it, is, it is very hard for, you know, mere mortals like us to get our heads around this kind of space travel, you know, moving from something that is kind of, uh, broadly speaking, understood within the current bounds of our physics paradigm to something that isn't. Can you just sort of quantify, if you will, Sunny, um, you know, what do we need to do to get to this new paradigm? Is it, do we, do we need, how, how, how badly do we need to break the current model we have of physics in order to get to where you want to go, what you've just described to me? <clears throat> you know, the, uh, in, in science, there are no shortcuts. Um, uh, and that's just, that, that's just part of the process of chipping away at, at, uh, at the unknown. Um, it, it's it's sometimes, some days it, it feels like you're, you're banging on a large boulder with a very small hammer, uh, making very, very uh, little visible progress. Uh, and I, I think it's just, there's, there's no substitute for uh, the, the time that's required. Uh, there's no, to, it, in my estimation, I, I, don't, I don't know that I see any kind of a, a, a quick or easy mechanism that one could engage to overcome the unknown, because we just, we don't know, and the only thing that helps us figure that out is, is taking time and, and working with the math and occasionally, you know, just sitting and staring at it for a very long time. And, uh, and when, you, when you think you're tired of it, stare at it some more. Um, uh, but it just, some of these things, there's just no substitute, it just requires time. And then in some cases, you know, it, it remains to be determined if, if it's uh, ever gonna be realizable. It, it, in some cases, it may not be, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I can't say I, I have hope and I'm interested in it. Uh, uh, and I think in the process of trying to you know, push the unknown uh, boundaries as hard as we can, we're certainly gonna realize things that are interesting that may make uh, life uh, better and, and easier for us in, in some way and help solve some of the problems that we're dealing with, so um, yeah. So clearly it's a very long game. What drives you on personally to do this? Uh, I'm just very interested in it. I, I enjoy thinking about it. Uh, I enjoy working with the mathematics. Um, I, I like uh, testing things in the lab. I like trying to figure out what, how, how do you build something uh, to test this, uh, this, this physics concept you're, you're thinking about. What are some ways that you can realize that? And oftentimes, even that process is, is very difficult. It's, it's uh, some of the things that we're working on now. We're working on you know, nanofabrication where we're, you know, we're on the very leading edge of, of nanofabrication, trying to push things beyond where they currently are capable. Uh, and so that, that in and of itself is an interesting thing to pursue because we're just, we're, not only are we working on unknown math and physics, we're also working on uh, unknown, uh, exploring unknown engineering to try and just continue to push the boundaries, if you will, 
so that I, I think this, it's, it's interesting and challenging. That's the part that keeps me engaged. It's interesting and challenging. And it's, uh, uh, it's always just a fun problem to, to wrestle with. So I, I get up every morning and I, I can't wait to come to work to just continue to try and uh, chew on a problem. So maybe there's something wrong with me. I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, you know, it, it, of course, we're, we're just deeply fascinated by this. Why, why is this important for the human race, do you think? You know, the, if, we were, if we're able to realize, uh, you know, a solar system-wide uh, culture and community uh, and economy, if you will, um, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to bring all the resources of an entire solar system to bear on the many and varied problems that we, you know, we are faced with uh, uh, as human beings. Um, life's hard and it's challenging and, and there's lots of different things that we have to wrestle with uh, and having that capability I, I think would be, uh, uh, be very impactful on you know just the, the, the human struggle if you will uh, we would in theory be able to change the definition of be able to change the definition of scarcity um, you know there's asteroids out there with all kinds of stuff that are in there and then the outer planets um, and imagine uh, things like uh, titanium or rare metals or uh, uh, anything you could think of. It just uh, the, it would change uh, uh, change the paradigm entirely. And then on top of that, the ability to go incredibly fast, uh, we would have to develop lightweight, uh, efficient power sources um, that, in some cases, would provide massive amounts of power. Uh, and as we know from here on the earth today, we, uh, the ability to provide uh, massive amounts of power uh, also improves uh, the quality of life for everyone that has access uh, to that kind of a capability, right? So I, I, I think it's, it's, it's good, it would be good on a number of fronts just to kind of think about the solar system wide uh, economy. If we were ever fortunate enough, blessed, enough, blessed to be able to go to a, another star system, I mean, that just changes it even, uh, it's an exponential improvement on, on what I just talked about. So, you know, I, I think in the process of pursuing this type of power and propulsion technology uh, has a significant uh, capability of improving life back here at home for us, uh, even here today, as we continue to make progress. So I, I think that's, that's why it's always worth pursuing, because it it, in the process of, of pursuing that word, noble and worthy goal, by, by being challenged to greatness, we will realize things that will help solve problems that we're dealing with today here on planet Earth. So you've just really articulated a, you know, a very good reason why we should be spending money on this. I mean, people questioned the Apollo program at the time for its expense, you know, was it worth sending a man to the moon in the 1960s and, and early 1970s for the, for the amount of money spent. But of course, we have benefited enormously uh, from not just spin-off technology, but just the whole endeavor aspect of that. You know, it's something that we're able to look back on, I think, and go, you know, that was truly important. It was a really inspirational, seminal moment in our history and, and the history of human development. So, would you articulate the same for this breakthrough propulsion physics in terms of a, a major evolutionary step change for us as uh, as the human race you know as we as as we move forward uh, <clears throat> as we continue to uncover some of the, the the secrets of physics if you will the uh, decode creation right um, as we uh, develop the mathematics and physics models, uh, they have enabled us to uh, you know, make and realize technology that has changed life drastically. Um, you know, the, the, in the process of working on the frontiers of physics, the, the, this breakthrough domain, uh, if we can come up with a deeper understanding than just those, those two circles I talked about on that Venn diagram, uh, that the, the model that we that we uncover will uh, provide mechanisms to uh, develop new technologies that we can't develop today because we, do, we don't even know 
the mathematics to try and exploit that. Uh, and one day, if we uncover those types of deeper models, we'll be able to make technology based on that new math and physics uh, that will come up with new technologies that we just hadn't even thought of. But you know, as I said, quantum mechanics makes this possible, right? Without quantum mechanics, you can't, you don't have this. Uh, and think about just in cap in my hand here, this few ounces of, of mass, if you will, uh, the amount of technology and implications and how that is so prevalent in our life in every aspect. You know, we're talking to each other uh, on, a, on a computer that's based on this technology, using a whole bunch of a global support network of technologies based on that math and, and physics. Uh, and so if you take quantum mechanics away, none of this is possible. Uh, and so the, the question is, is as we open up another circle on that Venn diagram, uh, what are the new, uh, new technologies that we can't think of right now uh, that are going to impact our lives? And they're, they're, we're, we're, we're fairly clever. We'll figure out, you know, neat ways to make things useful that uh, help make our lives better. So, yeah, I, I think it has enormous promise as we continue to try and uncover uh, a more fundamental understanding of, of nature. Uh, and lastly, Sonny, um, as you know, uh, the campaign that uh, we've launched at NCW is about leveraging the power of aerospace and defense sector technology on grand global challenges back here at home. Um, is that something that from your career and experience you would go along with? Do you think that aerospace and defense has capacity uh, both intellectually and in terms of its technology to leverage on grand global challenges back here at home? Well, the, the, uh, for the most part, the aerospace uh, sector does tend to work on the, the frontiers of what's possible. Uh, we always deal with systems that have uh, very high power densities, uh, the likes of which we, we don't even think of in a terrestrial sense. Uh, you know, the, the shuttle main engines, the, the turbo pumps, one, a, a one inch, one inch blade on the, one of the turbo pumps, the hydrogen turbo pumps, the shuttle main engine generates 900 horsepower, one blade, right? And I mean, it, that, that's just mind boggling. It's the amount of power density that we deal with and the, the temperatures that we have to deal with and the dynamic environment we have to deal with. Uh, so we, we, we have to tackle uh, some of the most hostile environments, the most uh, power dynamic uh, scenarios. Uh, so in terms of skills and talent, right, we, we, def we definitely get pushed as we get stretched as far as we can in the process of trying to tackle those kinds of problems. And so I think the, I mean, the instincts uh, and skills and talent that we have as a community, I think could be beneficial if, if uh, you know, we try and uh, ask this community to also think about uh, different ways to help make uh, you know clean energy uh, provide ways to reduce the amount of trash that we produce uh, as a as a species uh, how do we how do we make ourselves better at that uh, to operate in, in a closed environment you know imagine one day I was just thinking about this the other day imagine a day where you, know, you put your you put your trash bin out on the curb for the the guys and, and stuff to come by and pick up in a truck and carry off somewhere. Imagine that instead of just going to a landfill, everything that was in that bin is recyclable, right? And it's in some cases, maybe it's daydream, right? It's organic, right? And so you just, it, there's, there's, no, there's no landfills. Boy, wouldn't that be a, a fantastic outcome? Because uh, there's a lot of people on this planet. Uh, we, we really have to get better at this. And, and a, a supplementary to that, if I may, I mean, we obviously see uh, non-traditional players coming into the, the space sector. We've seen just in the last decade, SpaceX make tremendous inroads. Are you satisfied from where you sit that the sector, the aerospace sector and the space sector in particular, still has the innovative capacity to go out there and do great things? Or do you think breakthroughs in innovation will come from without the sector, if you like, in the in the way that we've seen it happen with SpaceX. Uh, I I think uh, the commercial space sector has been uh, it's been neat to watch 
Um, I met Elon Musk in, in 2003, uh, and it's been neat to kind of see his, uh, his accomplishments uh, and a couple other folks that have tried to you know, push the boundaries uh, like that. Uh, and and they're, they're, they're achieving incredible things. Um, but you, you asked a specific question about uh, breakthroughs, if you will, uh, I think in the context of, of physics, right? Uh, you know, I, I think that is um, uh, something like that uh, is mostly, this is just my opinion, I think something like that is kind of tied to an individual that is interested in an idea uh, and they have the, the skills and talent to go explore that. Uh, well, maybe you could even say SpaceX was born from an idea of an individual that was pursuing a passion of his, right? Uh, Elon Musk has, I think, gone on record as, as explaining his personal journey about what led him to go create uh, SpaceX. So uh, that too, I guess, was driven by an individual pursuing his passion. So it's been brilliant talking to you and catching up with you again. Thank you so much for uh, spending this time with us and um, sure, Nick, sure. good luck with everything you do. It's, uh, it's oh. inspirational. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Godspeed.